Baroque. When you hear that word, you might think of the art form from the 17th to 18th centuries. According to Wikipedia, the English word Baroque comes directly from the French. Some scholars state that the French word originated from the Portuguese term Baraco, meaning a flawed pearl. Though the art you see and the music you hear playing is nice, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm talking about the game Baroque. <laughs> After a few cutscenes, you are dropped into the hub area. If you walk forward a little bit, you'll come across a young man named Thing Thing. He can hold up to five items for you in the beginning, and later on he can hold up to ten. According to the backstory of this character, he also likes getting beat up, like maybe a little too much. If you keep moving forward, you'll run into the Archangel. He actually has some stuff to say to you. Look to the east, the distorted ones writhe in pain. Surely there's no point in replicating such fools. If you go to the east, you can actually find those distorted ones he was talking about. The first one you'll probably see is Neck Thing. He'll tell you that a strange sound is coming from the nerve tower. After him is the horned woman. She'll say that her eyes are twitching and that they won't stop twitching. Then there is Sack Thing. She says the pretend angels are speaking. They're saying, go to the nerve tower. And then finally is the Coffin Man. He hosts the tutorial dungeon. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the very first tutorial dungeon. What he'll tell you, what all the buttons do, etc. In the top left is your HP and VT level. If you've played any video game before, you already know what HP does. However, VT is a little different. If you take damage, your VT meter will slowly dissipate and give you a little more HP. However, if you run out of VT, it's gonna start draining your health. To keep your VT up, you need to find items that you can eat. Eating not only restores your VT, but it also helps restore your health too. You gotta watch what you eat though. Sometimes an item you eat will permanently take away VT while giving you a small boost to your HP. And next to both of those bars is your level meter. Leveling up is like any other game. Just kill stuff and it'll rank you up. When you rank up, it could rank up your health and your VT. It doesn't always upgrade your VT, but it will always upgrade your HP. At least you've got that when you level up. Another way to rank up your HP or VT meter is eating something when your health or VT meter is completely full. That's everything on the top left, now I'm gonna move on to the controls. This game uses tank controls. So that means up on the D-pad will move you forward, down on the D-pad will move you backwards, Left on the D-pad turns you left, and right on the D-pad turns you right. You can also strafe with L1 and R1. L1 makes you strafe left, and R1 makes you strafe right. I don't know why Baroque doesn't use the sticks, because the dual analog controller for the PS1 had already been out for a little while. I don't even know if the Saturn version of this game used the Psycho Saturn controller sticks or not. I'm not too familiar with the Saturn. Hitting triangle will open up your inventory. In here you can do normal inventory stuff. You can eat items, drop items, or even throw items. But most importantly, this is where you can equip items. In your inventory, this is where the square button can also come up some use. Hitting square will let you organize your inventory. That is the only use for the square button. Circle will let you attack. Although you won't be doing much damage without a sword of some kind, so you better find that first. Circle will let you also skip through text that characters are saying. Make sure you don't skip too fast though, otherwise you'll accidentally punch them in the face. And finally, X will bring up the minimap. The minimap won't show everything, it'll only show places you've been to or are currently in. I think you can do this tutorial area about four times max. You might be able to beat up the coffin man to get even more time in there, but I'd feel bad if I did that. After you do the tutorial, if you even did it, you don't have to do it, it's completely optional. There's not going to be anything left for you to do, so your best bet's probably just to head to the nerve tower. But before you go into the nerve tower, the archangel will give you a gun. Now this gun is pretty good, you can one hit most grotesques or monsters, they're called grotesques in this game. 
but it has limited ammo and you can't get any ammo back. What you have is what you're stuck with. I always forget to use it, or I use it when I'm stuck in a corner when I do remember to use it. It's pretty good at that. Now that you're in the nerve tower, you're going to be seeing lots of grotesques or monsters. We're going to be calling them grotesques from here on out. Now if you played the tutorial, you probably already saw some grotesques already. But I'm still going to go over them because there's still some new ones here that you probably haven't seen yet. I'll start off with the smallest one, the Gru. This guy is pretty harmless. He's not that big. They're only really dangerous in giant swarms, but you probably won't be seeing many giant swarms of these little guys. They're so small, you're supposed to be able to walk on them and crush them, but I can't seem to get that to happen every time, but I have had it happen before. The other one you'll probably see a lot is the moon. Not like the literal moon, but, but this flying fish thing. At first you might have some problems taking these guys down, but eventually you'll get the hang of it. They're not that big of a deal. They have something in common with the Grooves though, and that's that they're very deadly in swarms. Next up is the Kato. Maybe it's pronounced Kato. These guys are a little trickier to handle. These guys are pretty large. They roll around spitting out Grooves, and if you get too close they'll start hitting you with their tongue, which does a lot of poison damage. And if there's more than one, they can easily corner you. An easy way to take them down is to just strafe around them in a circle. They can't seem to keep up with you when you do that. And finally, on your first run, you might run into the Bulgars. Again, I'm not sure if I'm saying that one right. These guys are pretty basic. The small ones will push and shove you and even leap at you. Now, the tall one will also leap at you and shove you and stuff. But in addition to those two things, he'll also fart on you. And that's all you'll see on your very first run. Because you'll most likely die on your first run, and those are the only enemies that actually spawns on your first run. After you die, you'll get this cutscene. Now I think that cutscene was telling us that that first run was a simulation. As a matter of fact, it is telling us it was a simulation. Now it's time for the real deal. Now it's going to start spawning even more grotesques in. But before we get into the new grotesques, I'd like to say something real quick. This game is a roguelike, so you're going to die fairly often. You're going to get runs where you don't get everything you need, and you're going to have runs where you don't get anything at all. But that's alright, that's how that game is designed, so don't get upset if you keep dying or getting bad runs, it happens. Let's move on to the new grotesques you might meet and become very familiar with, the Littles. Now these little guys aren't exactly enemies, they're like a jump scare that happens every now and then when you enter the nerve tower. But I don't know where else to put them, so I'm putting them in this category. Next up is Seventeen, a phallic unicycler. The second he sees you, he'll start charging at you and knock you backwards if he hits you with it. If you get up close, he'll start hitting you with his head, and if you get behind him, he'll kick you like a horse. And finally on the list is the Gliro? I hope I said that one right. This guy sucks, he'll come up and steal your stuff. And when he's not stealing your stuff, he's up close in your face pushing you around. I'll leave it at those for now, but there's plenty more of them. There are some non-hostile NPCs though. The ones you'll probably see the most in the nerve tower are crypt angels. These guys act like stores, kind of. Let me explain. You can throw an item at a crypt angel and it'll remove debuffs for you, but if you throw two items at them, like a coat and a sword, it'll give you a random item back. Well, kinda random, it depends what items you're throwing at them. The example I used earlier with the coat and the sword, that would either give me a new sword or a new coat. It wouldn't give me like a piece of meat or something like that. Another non-hostile NPC is the Illusion. 
can't really talk about him. He's kind of a big story spoiler. Speaking of non-hostile NPCs, most of them spoil the story except for the Crypt Angel. Moving on from NPCs, let's talk about some of the items you'll come across. Now there's your basic stuff like swords and coats. Coats being armor, swords being, well, swords, your weapon. But then there's some stranger stuff like bones or brands. I'll start with bones. There's two types of bones, really. There's bones you can throw as a weapon, and then there's bones you can eat to gain experience points or health. Now, by default, all bones give you plus 10 HP and plus 10 VT when you eat them. But you don't always want to eat them. Sometimes you'll want to throw them. Sometimes when you throw them, they'll explode or catch on fire or just clonk them in the head. But in order to find out what they do, you first have to eat them or gnaw on them as the game says. But once you gnaw on them, you'll find out what they are permanently for that save file. So next time you pick it up, you won't have to gnaw on it, you'll just already know what it is. There's also boxes. Now think of these as loot boxes, but not bad, if that makes any sense. You can open it to get a random item, but sometimes it will explode in your face, very rarely though. So I guess forget the part where I said they weren't that bad. Sometimes the boxes can also have weird requirements in order to open them. The twin box is a good example. The twin box is required to have two boxes both named twin box. Then you can open them both, otherwise they won't open at all. There's not much to speak about, but like I said, they can give you a random item. It's up to you if that's worth opening or not, because there is, you know, a small risk of you exploding. And you can't forget imitation wings. These things are kind of rare, or at least I've never found many of them. I think the entire time I've been playing this game, I've only found about two or three. Maybe I just got bad luck. I guess an easy way to describe them is just like wearing another coat. There's no downside to them. I think there's one pair that'll break if you go down a floor, and I think there's another where you can't take off, but they all give some benefit at least. Now here's something gross. Parasites. These little guys can infest your sword, coat, or even yourself. That's kind of gross, actually. Like the imitation wings, they all have positive effects. Unlike uh, real life where, you know, they don't. There is one parasite that's not very good though, called the feather worm. If you make him infest an item, he'll fly away with it. At least he doesn't hurt you or anything. There's also torturers and patterns. The torturer requires you to manually activate it. The pattern, however, you throw down like a landmine. The torturer only damages grotesques, while the pattern has a chance to damage you or grotesques, just whoever steps on it. There's also Ampol, I hope I'm saying that right. These can give you positive or negative effects when you inject yourself with them. I seem to find the negative ones more often than others, but that could just be my bad luck. And finally, there are brands. A brand will give you a passive ability for your current run. Once you use a brand, it's on you. You can't take it off except for, you know, a few special items that can take it off. But those are hard to come by. That was a lot to take in. Before I get into the parts where I'm going to talk about the story and kind of spoil some stuff, I want to talk about the soundtrack for a second. The music in this game varies, not in terms of quality, but in terms of atmosphere. Take a listen to some of these tracks. Alright, that's all I can talk about without spoilers. I'm going to be talking about the story here, so if you don't want to hear that, I'll put a timestamp somewhere in the description. I'll give you a few seconds to find that and uh, get to the next part of the video. Are they gone? Oh, I hope so, because now I'm talking about the story. I'm going to try and sum this up as best as possible, otherwise I'd be here for like another 10 hours. A group led by the Archangel had discovered that God had returned to Earth. 
They started experimenting with God and slowly people started to turn into grotesques. After that, the Archangel started to remove pain from God and that created the Littles. They're supposed to be used as ammo for the gun the Archangel gives you in the beginning of every run. A few high-ranking members on the Archangel's group tried to stop them. The guy you play as in the game is actually one of those few high-ranking members. The Archangel found out about the high-ranking members trying to stop them. So the Archangel started the blaze. The Blaze was a cataclysm that altered the world. That's why the world looks so weird in-game. It's because of him. What about the illusion I talked about earlier? Remember those high-ranking members in the Archangels group I mentioned a little while ago? Well, the plan was they were going to fuse you with a god so they could hear God's will. But you had a conjoined twin brother, so they had to kill him. When your brother died, you became a mute and forgot all memories of him. The illusion is your conjoined brother's consciousness. And that's a quick rundown of the story. Keep in mind, I left a ton of stuff out just to give a brief summary. But if I got anything wrong, feel free to let me know in the comments below. Before I end the video, I'll briefly talk about some other Baroque-related stuff. There's the remakes on PS2 and Wii. I've played them. They're okay. I don't think they really hold a candle to the PS1 version. I don't think the atmosphere is as good either. It takes more of an anime approach to it in the remakes. Overall, it's okay though. If you want to play it that way, play it that way. There's also, for some reason, a bunch of mobile ports and like one exclusive mobile game. There's also not much about them. These weren't archived very well at all. In no particular order, here's Baroque FPS. It's supposed to be more of a shooter, it seems, but it looks to just be the PS2 remake on your phone. Then there was just a port of Baroque to the iOS. That's it. It was just a PS2 remake on iOS now. Gone forever, of course. The one you can actually still download is Baroque Become a Meta Being. It's just like weird Baroque themed Frogger. There's also some non-mobile games to talk about, like Baroque Typing, which I assume is just Typing of the Dead but Baroque style. I don't know, there's not much on this. There's Baroque Shooter, which is just a shoot 'em up but Baroque themed. Finally, there's a prequel visual novel thing. The visual novel is actually translated. But it's just a wall of text, it's not like a playable thing or anything. But if you want to read it, I'll leave a link in the description. And that's all the projects I know about. I'm sure I missed a few, because like I said earlier, a lot of this stuff isn't archived at all. That was a long video. But if you liked it, I'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed and all the other YouTube stuff. Maybe I'll even see you next time.